2020 virtual conference. 2020 has been a challenging year, and we want you to have the tools and the knowledge to navigate 2011, 2021. <laughs> we, saw, we at Spark Thought are excited to launch SparkCon based on our backdrop of innovation, marketing leadership, and quality of service. It is a proud moment for us to bring this together an amazing, an amazing panel of speakers to share their expertise with you <clears throat> during these trying times. Our keynote speaker is, has an extensive and ex impressive experience in the oil and gas industry. Most of you listened to him on Oil and Gas This Week podcast with over 1.3 million downloads and counting. Today, we will be here to talk to us about the future of oil and gas. Without further ado, it is an honor to introduce SparkCon 2020's first keynote speaker, Mark LaCour. Thank you, Mark, for being here. Yeah, appreciate the, the uh, invite, Russ, and, and everybody else at SparkCon. And I just came for the free breakfast. I didn't realize I was actually have to get on the camera and actually talk about stuff. Um, but since I'm here and since we're talking about stuff, let's talk about the future of the oil and gas industry. Don't worry, people. It's awesome. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? All right. 2021 has been a strange year, to say the least. Uh, we start the year with a double black swan event, which in the history of oil and gas has never happened. So typically, uh, because hydrocarbons are one of the true global commodities, every eight to 12 years, we have a cycle of low crude prices. When that cycle happens, because there's more crude on the market than normal, prices get depressed and the part of the industry, the upstream part of the industry suffers. Now, the upstream part of the industry is the part that gets oil out of the ground, right? So think of exploration and production, think of the big operators, but also think of the service companies, think of the Halliburtons and the Schlumbergers and the Weatherfords who all get most of their revenue from the upstream side of the house. Every time we have a down cycle in crude prices, they hurt. However, here's the part that a lot of people don't recognize. When we have low crude prices, historically, the downstream part of the industry, and downstream is what turns hydrocarbons into products to sell, typically booms. So think about it. Think about if you had a factory that made men's shirts, and that factory grew, and pretty soon you had a global men's shirt uh, business. You had manufacturing, you had supply, you had logistics, you had retail, right? And all this machine was humming along. You're selling men's dress shirts all over the world. And you wake up in the morning and you look at your phone and there's a note that says, hey, our raw cotton cloth has been cut by 60%. Think about that. With, what that would do for your men's dress shirt company, right? You'd explode in growth because your profitability went through the roof because your raw feedstock was cut by 60%. Typically in a downstream, uh, in a down market in upstream, downstream prospers because their raw feedstock, the crude natural gas they use to turn into products is so much cheaper. So I want you to think about this last downturn in the beginning of this year and the downturn before that in 2014. Did you notice even though uh, crude was going for less than $50 a barrel that your car tires were cheaper or your soccer balls or the uh, or lipstick or fertilizer? If you notice none of those products got cheaper but their raw feedstock was cut by 60%. So what was happening? They were making money hand over fist. This year in 2021, that didn't happen. So what happened, we had the, the low crude price environment caused by basically a, a sales fight between Russia and OPEC. And at the same time, we had the COVID-19 pandemic, which greatly suppressed the use of hydrocarbons. So the first time ever when we had low crude prices, we didn't have an increase, we actually had a decrease in demand in downstream. That has never happened in our industry. So it's a double black swan event where we're being squeezed from both sides and it's horrendous. And one of the things about this double black swan event is nobody has ever been through this before. So nobody has any experience to draw upon to figure out how do we deal with this. So in 2021, it looks very gloomy for the oil and gas industry. And quite frankly, it is. I unfortunately have had a lot of friends, a lot of business acquaintances lose jobs, lose companies, and some of them even more. Um, and you're, you're reading a lot of stuff about how this is the end of the oil and gas industry. In fact, even BP in their global report just released that they think peak demand will happen in 2030, which is only about nine years away. I actually don't agree with that. We're going to get into that in a minute. Um, but this has been a very um, hard year for the oil and gas industry. However, it's going to get better. So we go to the next slide. Cities civilization, um, modern lifestyle, right? Here in the US and in Europe, we take that for granted. 
But one of the things that's happened is the rest of the world is catching up with us. You look at all these rural agrarian societies, look at China and India and Vietnam. Most of their population lives in farms and their workforce is their family. So they have large families and they grow enough food to feed themselves. And hopefully they have a little bit extra and they can sell it and make some cash to buy other things. That trend is only accelerating. By 2050, three quarters of the world will live in cities. Now, there's a lot of interesting uh, in things about living in cities that we take for granted. One is actually the use of energy. Um, if you look at what's going on, let's pick Vietnam. Vietnam um, does not have the infrastructure we have here and in Europe. They don't have miles and miles of high tension primary lines. They don't have miles and miles of low tension. They don't have electrical generation, electrical distribution, electrical retail. And, and I, I get it, folks. They do have it in the big cities, but most of the country doesn't have that. And so right now, if you live in a rural village, your demand for energy is relatively low. You're cooking on wood. Maybe, maybe if you're lucky, charcoal, but predominantly wood. Um, you need enough electricity to charge an iPad to keep one light running and run a small refrigerator. Well, solar is excellent for that, right? Because you don't need the infrastructure. You have a solar cell, you have some type of battery system, and you can actually live that, that two or three watt a day lifestyle. However, when we move into modern times and modern civilization, that two or three watts a day turns into 20 or 30 or 35 kilowatts of electricity. You know, I live in uh, Richmond, Texas. I'm in a 2,900 square foot house. Uh, Texas is very hot, so we have a lot of air conditioning going on. And it's not uncommon for me to burn 10 or 15 kilowatts of electricity a day. The only way I can do that is because electricity is so cheap here in the U.S. In fact, electricity has gotten so cheap in the U.S. that we're bringing manufacturing jobs back. Um, one of the biggest costs, especially with complex manufacturing, is elect electrical costs. And now electricity is so cheap in the U.S. that we're bringing manufacturing jobs back from overseas. The reason that electrical cost is so cheap is because of hydrocarbons, predominantly natural gas. As the U.S. switches from coal to natural gas, the cost of producing electricity drops. And at the same time, the emissions drop by 60% without doing anything else but switching from coal to natural gas. This trend will continue around the world. It's happening here and in Europe. And if you've noticed with a lot of the... Um, last say five or six years with infrastructure build out, you're seeing a lot of LNG or liquefied natural gas infrastructure being built here in the US. And you might ask why. <clears throat> so I got a question for you. I haven't looked today. I think the uh, 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 WTI is going for like $39.99 a barrel. That's what that was yesterday. How can WTI crude be exactly $39.99 a barrel, both here in Texas and Tokyo, Japan, Rio de Janeiro and Kongsberg, Norway, all at the exact same time. You want to guess what the answer is? It's because we have a global infrastructure to move that crude all around the world for almost nothing. Interesting fact, at any one point, there's more weight in oil being moved through our world's oceans than all the weight of the fish combined. Think of the scope of that. So if I don't want to pay $39 a barrel here in Houston, for almost nothing, I can move that barrel of crude oil to Kongsberg, Norway, and they'll buy it for $39. Now, the thing that's important about that is, number one, that explains why it's a true global commodity. And when something happens, such as undersupply or oversupply, uh, it affects the prices so widely. But what about natural gas? That infrastructure today does not exist for natural gas. If you look at what natural gas is going for here in North America, and then look at what it's going for in Asia Pacific, there's an enormous delta. It's way more expensive in Asia Pacific. Why? Because there's no inexpensive way to move that natural gas around the world. However, as we're building these LNG plants, and LNG basically takes the gas, compresses it to a liquid, so then it's economical to ship, and now you can move it in things like super tankers. So we're building the next generation of world's infrastructure to be able to move natural gas around the world the exact same way we move crude oil. When we get there, the entire world is going to prosper from that, right? Because we're going to have cheap, abundant electricity everywhere. When you think of things about edu like things like education, think about this crazy year right now. You know, um, I have a son that's uh, 10th grade in high school. Him and his peers for most of this year went to school remotely. Can you imagine trying to go to school remotely without electricity? This is not going to happen, right? So this cheap, abundant energy source is, is going to propel the world into the future. And that future also involves renewables. It's really um, a little bit disconcerting to me that some really good marketing person in the past pushed renewables and hydrocarbons to, to think they're competitors. They're not competitors. It's all energy. 
Um, if you think about our history as a species, at one point, the predominant way we produce energy was with biofuels, right? We burned wood. That's not good for the environment at all. In our very recent history, we thought it was a really cool way to light our homes to kill whales, right? That's not sustainable either. But hydrocarbons are. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit more about the, the nature of the hydrocarbon molecule itself. But the biggest point I want to leave here is our the world's population is growing about two and a quarter percent a year. Right. But our energy consumption is growing almost four percent per year. Why? Because when we pull these populations out of the rural lifestyle and we bring them into modern lifestyle, they use more energy. Right. And right now, that energy mix includes everything. But the predominant cheap, reliable source is hydrocarbons. Um, so without hydrocarbons, moving the world's population into modern society is impossible. I think it's really interesting. So I'm on the board of the American Petroleum Institute, API. I'm the director of public relations of the Houston chapter. The API is the one that sets the standards for everything that goes on offshore. And at the same time, it's a big political lobby group to support the oil and gas industry to our members of Congress. Our head lobbyist is a Democrat. And I'm not going to get into politics here. I just want to tell you something interesting. And when he was doing his thesis in college, um, he was figuring out how much energy it would take to bring the rest of the world up to modern standards. And no matter how many times he ran the mathematical model, the only fuel that could grow that quick to supply that cheap, re abundant, reliable energy was hydrocarbons. And he realized that his views on renewables was flawed. And so in order to help the world, he went and became a political lobbyist for the group that supports the oil and gas industry. So think about that for a minute. Politically, he has the same views as a lot of liberals right, around hydrocarbons. But once he did the math, he realized that the only way we could move the world that way was to use hydrocarbons. So even though BP says peak oil demands can happen 2030, not only do I not agree with it, but a lot of other think tanks don't agree with that. We're going to come out of this year at much lower. We typically, so in 2019, we ran about 100 million barrels globally. I think in this year, we're at like 91 million. So we had a decrease in 8.9 million barrels, which is substantial. But it's not the huge decrease that you would think from 100 million barrels, only 8 million barrels. We're going to get into 2021, 2022. We'll get back to that 100 million barrel demand. And then as we go forward, that demand will only go up. Now, here's the other interesting thing about this. Here and in Europe, we're using less and less hydrocarbons to make fuels, right? But we're using more and more hydrocarbons to make stuff. So when I talked earlier about those rural populations that will be brought to modern cities, they're going to need things like Tupperware, paint, duct tape. Uh, pins, highlighters, carpet, mini blinds, all that comes from hydrocarbons. So the future of hydrocarbons is bright. It's just we need to get through this uh, dip in demand uh, in 2020. Can we get to the next slide, please. All right. I'm going to tell you a really feel good story. Um, this is something that I ran across. And I've actually spent a lot of time uh, talking to the principals of this group. This is Recon Africa. Recon Africa is a group of some of the top scientists and experts and engineers in the world. Um, you have uh, Daniel Jarvis part of this. He is recognized as one of the top uh, petrochemical geologists on the planet. Uh, you also have um, uh, Nick Steinberg. Um, Nick Steinberg is one of the people that helped invent and made, pros um, made financially possible hydraulic fracking. Uh, you have David Mitzka, which is another one of the top uh, geologists on the planet. Uh, Bill Cathy, one of the top geophysicists, and they have this whole team of people. And they go, okay, in this 2020 market where the price of crude is depressed, where demand is depressed, is there an opportunity for us to do something out of the box, do something different? And there was. So what they did is they found some old geodata, and they used artificial intelligence to comb through the geodata. So they, they did not go out and do new surveys. They had old surveys that they used modern technology to sift through, and they found something that is miraculous. They found a re reservoir in a part of Africa that if their test wells are correct, is bigger than the Permian Basin. They also found it in a part of Africa, which is one of the few places where you can uh, lease and buy the mineral rights. You may not know this, but most of the world outside the US, the government owns the minerals. So the government owns the natural gas and the crude oil on the ground, even if it's in your property, right? Even if that property has been in your family for a thousand years, the government still own it. There's a very few places that the uh, people that own the property can own those mineral rights. The US is one and Dubai, Africa is another. The reason that's important is that fosters innovation competition because when individual people can own the minerals, then they, there's competition in the market to get those minerals out of the ground effectively, cost effectively and safely. 
safely, right? Whereas governments don't always have those motivators to drive them. So they go to this part of Africa, they, they literally lease this entire area, which is bigger than the Permian Basin. They struck oil. They're drilling right now, right? They're profitable at $22.07 a barrel. It's, it's a feel-good story. In all this doom and gloom, this is a beacon of what the future is bringing to the oil and gas industry. If you look at our industry, historically, if you're from the outside, we look like we're risk at first. Um, it looks like we don't like anything new, right? It looks like we're old fashioned, but we're not. We're actually risk at first. So if you think about what I do day to day or what anybody does in the oil and gas industry, if we make a mistake, people can die. And not only can people die, but you can have an environmental catastrophe which can destroy a company literally overnight. Very few industries have those risks. So because we have those risks, if we have a process or a technology or a tool in place that we've used for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and nothing's leaked and nothing's blown up and nobody's died, we don't want to change that process. And that's done as well. That's that's that stood as well as an industry for 100 years. Well, now we're entering into the new age of oil and gas. And a lot of my peers think I'm crazy when I say this, but I think in 20 years, the oil and gas industry is going to look like Silicon Valley. It's going to be sexy. It's going to be fast. It's going to be a very flexible workforce. We've gotten through this trough of negative public perception, and we're going to be a high-tech industry. And this Recon Africa is a perfect example of that. Here's a bunch of guys with a bunch of experience using new technology, new processes, made a discovery that's going to make them and their investors a lot of money. And at the same time, they're learning from this. One of the things about hydrocarbons, and we talked earlier about BP's uh, prediction of peak demand, is there's this um, misconception from the 70s. So this guy named Hubbard that used to work for Shell in the 50s, uh, using what data he had at that moment, came up with the theory of peak oil supply. And so in his mathematical model, at some point in the future, and that point was around 1990, uh, the world would run out of hydrocarbons or run out of um, recoverable hydrocarbons and so our supply of hydrocarbons would start going down and that spelled a lot of doom and gloom that would drive prices up um, there'd be uh, less resources for the world to to use and so that was a real issue what he didn't know is that he didn't have enough data if you look at something like hydraulic fracking which a lot of people have heard of it's really an old technology fracking with a new technology horizontal drilling that has allowed us to tap into hydrocarbons that we could not tap into earlier when you look at the map of the U.S., you look at the shell plays, those shell plays are not new. Those shell plays are where Standard Oil was born, right, where the Rockefellers made their money. And what they did is they would, using very primitive technology, they would drill very shallow wells, and they would often hit things called gushers, where the oil would come out of the ground under its own pressure. And once they quit having gushers, they thought the fields were depleted based upon the technology they had at that time. What they didn't know is that the best operators at that point got maybe 5% of the oil out the ground. That's 5%. We're coming back to this next generation of technology and process, hydraulic fracking, and we're maybe, at, with the best operators, maybe to get 15% of that oil out of the ground. Well, think about that. If you had 15 to 5, that's 20%, which means 80% of those hydrocarbons are still in the ground. Every year, there's new technology, new process to tap into those hydrocarbons. And here's something else. Hydrocarbons are still being made. Nobody ever talks about that. So they're not being made at the same rate they were made in the Pleistocene and Jurassic era, but they're absolutely still being made right here in the Gulf of Mexico. We have zooplankton and algae growing in the shallow, warm seas of the Gulf of Mexico. It dies. It settles at certain parts of the Gulf of Mexico. At the bottom of the, of the Gulf, there's a no oxygen uh, layer. This plankton, zooplankton falls in that no oxygen layer, so it doesn't decompose. And then the Mississippi River is laying, uh, pushing out layers of sediment and salt, which um, and then lands on top of the, the dead microorganisms, which then eventually, as we go through time, compresses it and heats it. That's hydrocarbons, right? So the sun will run out of helium before we'll run out of hydrocarbons. So the, the idea of peak supply uh, was proven false. Now, peak demand is really interesting. So there's a lot of theorists, myself included, that think at some point, as the world population growth slows, um, and the world peaked its population growth in the 60s. Right now, we're not slowing down point, but we're still growing. So don't think we're going backwards. We're still growing just at a slower rate. But at some point in our future, the demand for hydrocarbons will level out. Now, here's where a lot of people get it wrong. They think the supply of hydrocarbons, the demand, will level out and then drop off. It won't. It will go up. It will level off and just stay level, right? So the future depends on hydrocarbons. And we're getting a little bit more of that later. But this Recon Africa is a perfect example of how 
in hard times, really smart people using new technology can be profitable at sub $30 a barrel and find reservoirs that other people have never found. So the future of finding recoverable reservoirs is bright and it's fun. I mean, imagine using artificial intelligence to actually find reservoirs that, you know, a big super major missed because they didn't have that technology 10 years ago. Uh, I, wish, I wish these guys a lot of success. Like I said, it's, it's a ray of hope in what's going on in 2020. And you watch the 2021, 2022, they're going to kill it. And you can see a lot of the other operators copy what they're doing. It's happening right now. Can we go to the next slide, please? Carbon. You hear a lot of talk about carbon. Um, let's talk about what it really is. Carbon is stardust. It comes from the death of stars. Um, um, at a conversational level, the amount of carbon on our planet Earth is basically the same as it was a million years ago. And I know, I know haters. I know that we lose some carbon through uh, some of the uh, materials we send into space. I know we, we, we gain some carbon through asteroids and meteorites hit Earth. I, I get that. But basically, the amount of carbon we have on the Earth is, is static. So... If you look around, if you're in a room of people, if you look around, every person you see is a carbon-based life form. Without carbon, we would not be here. And the carbon that's in your body was probably in a Tyrannosaurus rex. And before that, it was in a fish. And before that, it was in an amoeba. And before that, it was in a, 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 a red dwarf, you know, 13 light years away, right? So the carbon is one of the basic building blocks of life. And remember earlier, I told you how hydrocarbons are still being made? Hydrocarbons, so think of uh, gas and uh, uh, crude oil, is the most organic natural fuel there is. It's literacy, literally legacy sunlight, right? So remember the plants back in history stored the sunlight? They, they use the sunlight to convert uh, sugars, uh, using a carbon dioxide to convert into sugars, which then turns it into hydrocarbons later when they're compressed by Mother Earth. So hydrocarbons are basically legacy sunlight um, pulled in by uh, plants and animals that have been baked and nurtured by Martha Earth for millions of years. I don't know how much more organic you can get than that. As an industry, we've allowed people to misconstrue the importance of hydrocarbons and also where they come from. So one of the big things when you look at the renewable market is that we need to crack the energy storage problem. Uh, we've gotten really good at making electricity cheap from both solar and wind. The problem is we can't store it cheap. And, and we're working on that, right? There's some new battery technology out there. It's really exciting. There's also some new mechanical um, uh, um, inventions going on around storage electricity. It's also really exciting. But right now, the, the cost of trying to use uh, wind and solar 24 hours a day all over the world is the storage cost, which drives the prices of actually using it through the roof. I want you to think about this. What is the cost of storing hydrocarbons? It's nothing. It's in the ground. It's storing itself, right? So that's one of the economic reasons why hydrocarbons are so economical is the storage costs are zilch. So the other thing about carbon is that when we think of carbon dioxide, um, once again, there's been a lot of, uh, and, and I blame a lot of this on social media, a lot of misconception around carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, number one, is plant food. It's a natural part of our atmosphere. And our current rate right now, I think we're around 440 parts per million, is actually, if you look at the history of the Earth, in the low range. Um, if you go to any greenhouse anywhere in the world, they artificially inflate the amount of carbon dioxide in the greenhouse anywhere from one to 3,000 parts per million because their plants grow quicker. Uh, if you think about Jurassic Park, the Jurassic period, at that time, uh, carbon dioxide was about 12 to 1,500 parts per million. We had a much wetter, much warmer, much healthier world. The more carbon dioxide we have in our environment, the better the plants grow. The earth is going through a greening process right now because our carbon dioxide is creeping up. And a lot of people want to tie that directly to global warming. And once again, I'm not going to get into politics, but carbon dioxide is actually not a big greenhouse gas. If you actually Google top greenhouses gas, you can see that water vapor is the number one greenhouse effect gas. Around 85% of the greenhouse effect is caused by water vapor. Carbon dioxide is about 3% of the greenhouse effect. So um, global warming, in my personal opinion, is a fact, um, but the amount of impact that carbon dioxide is playing into it is not as big as a lot of people would say. And it's vital to our way of life and it's plant food and we're all carbon-based life forms. So carbon is not the enemy. Uh, carbon um, is a part of our natural world. Now, how mankind is affecting our natural world is what we need to figure out. And it's a really hard thing to figure out. Uh, in some ways, some of the stuff we've done to the world is much better than it was before. Um, if you're a white-tailed deer hunter in North America right now, there's more white-tailed deer than in the history of mankind. 
right? You look at the successes we've had with bald eagles and manatees and bringing them back from extinction. Uh, you look at the coastal restoration projects that we've built uh, to save coastlines. You know, so because part of, of what we do impacts the earth, we can direct that impact in a way that it's always positive. Once again, the problem is though, here in Europe, here and in Europe, we've gotten over our industrial hump, right? So I have a 2020 Infinity that I bought at the beginning of this year. At 80 miles an hour, it puts out 1% of the emissions that my 1967 Mustang puts out cut off in the garage. My 1967 Mustang had no um, closed fuel system. It had no fuel injectors, no catalytic converters, no lean burn technology, no computer. So literally that car, which I love, sitting in the garage, puts out more emissions than my new car running at 80 miles an hour. That's because we've figured out the technology and we figured out a way to make that technology um, not cost prohibitive so that we can have lean burn cars, lean burn electrical generation, lean burn lawnmowers, uh, outboard engines, all that sort of stuff. Same way in Europe. But what do we do with these emerging populations? Do we go to China and tell them they have to use catalytic converters? Because they're not right now. Um, that's not fair. Right. Do we go to India and tell them they have to install carbon capture devices on their coal fire power plants? That's not fair either. So when you're looking at things like greenhouse gases, you're looking at air pollution, it's the emerging economies that are contributing most, not us. Our air pollution peaked in 1977. If you're old like me, you remember things like acid rain and the smog over LA. It's gone. We fixed it. Now it's starting to happen in other parts of the world. And our, our duty to other parts of the world and to humanity is how do we help these other countries economically figure out ways to curb their emissions? Um, it's not an easy thing to figure out. And in this year's political climate, that conversation has been thrown out the window. I'm hoping that once things settle down after the election, we can start looking at that because we can help these other countries make sure that they speed up their fast track to emissions. You hear a lot about the plastic problems in the ocean. Almost 100 percent of the plastics you recover in the ocean right now either came from Africa or China. The reason is they skipped the infrastructure level. So in this country, in Europe, we grew slowly. And at one point, people were dumping trash in the streets. At one point, sewage was dumped in the streets. And at some point, when we figured out the germ theory, we figured out that's not a good thing for our population. So we started building sewages. We started building infrastructure to, to correct, uh, collect trash. And then eventually, that trash, figured out, we figured out ways to deal with it, whether we combust it, recycle it, bury it. And so in the US and Europe, we had this whole infrastructure. So when you put your garbage out or when you flush the toilet, all that stuff's taken care of in a way that's environmentally responsible. In Africa and China, they grew so fast, they skipped that. They don't have the sewage treatment plants. They don't have the garbage infrastructure. So what happens? They dump all that stuff in the rivers, and it ends up in the ocean. So as Western society, how do we help them curb that? And we can. Um, it's just we need to set the reality points that if we're looking to make this planet a better place, the biggest way to move the needle is help these emerging economies deal with the problems that they're dealing with. Next slide, please. So speaking of emerging economies, this is a beautiful story. I, I love this. I love people. Um, one of the things a lot of people don't know is 60% of the world is fed with fertilizer made from natural gas. There's no way to, to, to get around that. And why would you want to get around that? Why would you not want to be able to provide farmers with cheap fertilizers so they can grow food, not only for their families, but for, for the population? As India and China especially come out of their rural lifestyles, it looks like India is going to eventually pass up China, not only in population growth, but in GDP. That's going to be a big political change in the world. And are we setting up not only our industry, but our population to help deal with that as these emerging economies become um, economic engines? So right now, if you think of the world economy, the U.S. is the engine. If you think of a train that's pulling everybody else behind it. Right. We're the biggest uh, economic powerhouse in the world. We do about four trillion dollars a day in turnover right here in the U.S. And that's pre-COVID, by the way. Um, at some point, we will be passed up. We'll be passed up by China and eventually by India. And we have to learn how to deal with that. And what we want to make sure is, as all these young people are growing up, they have access to education, clean water, health care, and cheap, abundant, reliable energy so they can grow, so they can change the world. Um, I find it fascinating um, if, if you end up talking to these young people um, anywhere in the world, if you travel, their view is radically different than my generation. They grew up with the internet, right? They know what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, it's getting harder and harder if you had a dictator type of government to suppress their people um, because they're learning. Um, it's even there's weird offshoots like little girls now have a better uh, body image than they did 20 years ago because there's so many pictures of other little girls in the world, right? So it's even things like self esteem is actually going up. Now, 
The, uh, the, but we have a flip problem, right? The, the other side of the problem is something called a cognitive bias. So the way our brains are wired is anything that we, any bit of information we bring in that agrees with how we think gets two points. And anything that we bring in that doesn't agree with how we think only gets one point. And that was great when we lived in smaller uh, communities. We lived in tribes and uh, the amount of information entered our brain was small, right? So I know for a fact that if it's in the fall and I want to go uh, shelter in that cave because it's getting cold, I learned from experience there might be a bear in that cave, so I have to be careful. So when I walk up to that cave and I see a bear track, that hits my cognitive bias and reinforces that, which keeps me alive. Let's layer social media on that same genetic problem, right? The same genetic trait we have. So if I'm somebody that doesn't believe in vaccines and I'm a big social media user, the algorithms and social media realize that about me and start feeding me more and more anti-vaccination type of news, which reinforces my cognitive bias. Um, that's an issue that uh, we're going to have to deal with as a global population. Um, it's affecting our politics. It's affecting our medical care. But it's also affecting the oil and gas industry. Um, I find it um, a bit disconcert. Dis I find it a, a bit hard to deal with that when I travel to Nigeria now and I meet some teenagers and I talk to them about going to work for Chevron, they go, I don't want to work for Chevron. Chevron's destroying the planet. Up until just recently, those teenagers would have been overjoyed to get a job with Chevron, right? Because it was income, it was medical care, it was food, it was clothing. The whole village actually 10 years ago would rejoice when one of their members got a job with one of the big oil companies. Now they don't want to come work for our industry. And as as a member of this industry, I take full responsibility for that. For the last 70 years, when anybody says anything negative about the oil and gas industry in public, we don't raise our hand and correct it. And because of the algorithms and social media, along with the cognitive bias, now there are a lot of people that in their hearts believe we're destroying the planet. And we're not. If you work in this industry, you know that we have more rigor and more reporting around uh, how we affect the environment than any other industry I know. I mean, literally in the Gulf of Mexico, if I drop three ounces of crude oil, that's an incident that I have to report. Yet go to a trucking terminal, there's a hundred years of diesel being spilt on the ground. Nobody cares. And so as an industry, we're dealing with this negative uh, public perception, which I think is has hit its troughs or hit its lowest point last year. I think we're starting to climb out of that. But as an industry, when you look at all the great stuff we do for the planet, all the great stuff we do for our employees and for our local communities we operate in, that negative public perception is probably the biggest thing that is, is holding us back. And we need to fix it. And the way we fix it is not talking opinions, not talking politics. It's just talking about the facts. You know, not very many people know how much of the world is fed with fertilizer made from natural gas. It's little things like that. So, you know, as we're looking forward, the, the, the outlook for industry, number one, is very positive. Um, we're not going anywhere. We can't go anywhere. We literally can't. But number two, we got to deal with this negative public perception, which I think as an industry, we're starting to do a better, better job of. But we need to get it back to the point where young people around the world are happy to come work in our industry. Um, you know, when you think of high tech, people don't normally think of oil and gas. And I'll challenge you on that. You do see a deep water project. You go to you know 10,000 feet of water, another 8,000 feet of rock, and you actually turn that project into a producing well. I challenge any other industry to be able to pull that off, hit budget, um, hit start dates, hit due dates. Um, you look at some of the subsea hardware they build. You look at the trees and the blowout preventers that have to control that well, even if a person isn't there. Um, it's it's I, This is one of the most high-tech industries out there. We just have not done a good job of talking about it. And all that's changing, which I, I think is awesome. Next slide. And you go, Mark, what is this spaceship doing in your presentation? Did you make a mistake? Uh -uh. One of my favorite things about hydrocarbons is it's the only fuel that has enough energy density to get us out of our gravity well. So uh, SpaceX right now is running kerosene and liquid oxygen. Kerosene comes from crude oil. Their next generation of, of rocket engines will run liquid methane. Liquid methane is basically compressed natural gas. It's the only energy, the only energy can get us out in space. But it's way more than just the energy to get us out of our gravity well. You want to guess what the adhesives are made of that hold that heat shield to that spacecraft? You want to guess what the spacesuits are made of? You want to guess what the insulation of the wires for the computers? You want to guess what the tubing made for the oxygen reclamation? You want to guess the plat the tanks that hold the wastewater and the fresh water? You want to guess what all that's made out of? It's hydrocarbons. Space travel is impossible without hydrocarbons. So if you're like me and you believe that mankind's future involves space travel, 
then we have to have hydrocarbons, which by the way, people, I meant to uh, bring this up in the beginning. If you have questions, drop them into the chat and we'll get to them when we close down. Um, but back to my outer space thing, um, regardless if you believe in a grand creator or not, if you look at our solar system, at about the halfway point, there's a planet called Saturn. And around Saturn, there's a moon called Titan. And Titan is covered with lakes of liquid natural gas. It's a refuel spot, right? So SpaceX, now I gotta be careful here because Elon Musk is really good at leaking details to make you think something's real when it's not. So this is based upon leaked details from, from SpaceX. But according to SpaceX, they've already done the engineering to figure out how to drop a low gravity pump system in and actually build tubing, build a stack so they can pump that liquid nat uh, natural gas from the surface of Titan to, uh, to the outer realms of where their gravity is so that uh, spacecraft can refuel. That's amazing, right? And so when you think about our future, I firmly, I absolutely believe that at some point, maybe not in my lifetime, but at some point you'll be looking at videotape and it's asteroid belts being mined or it's planets being mined for their hydrocarbons. And the companies that are doing it are the Halliburton's and the Slumberjays and the Baker Hughes. I think space travel and the exploration of hydrocarbons outside of our planet is just a natural fit for humanity. If you talk to any chemical engineer, one of the most useful tools in their tool bit the tool bag is hydrocarbons. Literally, you can make hydrocarbons into everything from lipstick to plastic to soccer balls to body armor to adhesives, all how you configure it. And the key there is you can do it extremely energy efficiently. It does not take much energy to manipulate hydrocarbons um, molecules around. So when I'm looking at the future of our industry, not only do I realize that it's going to contribute to our decline in global emissions, it's going to increase um, the ability for populations to move into modern um, lifestyles. It's going to allow us to explore out of space. It's going to allow us to feed our people. And all of that is going to happen no matter what anybody else says. Now, the renewable side of the market is really interesting. Um, I've never seen renewables as competition. And if you heard our intro, we have several podcasts, oil and gas podcasts, one of which soon will be the oil and gas renewables podcast. Um, the thing with renewables now is they're facing a lot of the pushback that we faced the last 10 years. You're seeing people push back on the infrastructure needed to bring the electricity from wind farms back to civilization. Uh, you're seeing people have issues with the noise from wind farms, with the bird kills from the blades. Uh, you're seeing uh, people having issues with the ground coverage caused by solar. Uh, and all that can be mitigated, but they're having the same issues, environmental issues that we've faced, faced for decades. And at some point, if we don't take, get this under control, people, the cost of energy is going to go up globally. When the cost of energy goes up, the, the part of the population that affects the most, the most dramatically, is the lower income people. You know, we do okay here. If my electricity bill went up 10 or 15 or 20 percent, I would be fine. A lot of lower income people, if their electricity bill goes up 10 or 15 percent, they can't pay it. Uh, you watch what happened in Germany over the last eight years, and then their Interwind program, where basically they had committed to have at least 20% of their uh, energy needs met by renewables. And they tried really hard. They worked really hard to do it. But a lot of times there's a difference between what you plan and what's in the lab and what the practicality is when you actually do it in the field. And unfortunately, Germany ran into that. So in their process of trying to quickly move over to a 20% mix of renewables, they couldn't keep up. They had rolling blackouts. So then they had to build more cold fire power plants to take in the space when the renewables couldn't produce enough energy and the cost of energy went up. If you're into cool stuff like uh, mechanical watches or really high end knives, Germany has always been the center of that in the world because they did really good at doing precision manufacture. I mean, they were the best in the world. Nothing against my Swiss friends. Um, but now the cost of electricity has went up so much in Germany that they have driven out their precision manufacturing. A lot of the people that live in Germany, their electrical bill is pretty close to their house note now. That's not the direction we want to go, especially not when we have the resources to do the opposite, to make electricity ridiculously cheap for everybody. So space travel is a big part of our future. The industry is going to be fine once we get out of this year, but the industry will change and we have to be OK with that change. Uh, we have to maintain our stewardship to the environment. We have to make sure we work really hard to let the local communities that we operate in and understand that we're not just there to make a butt that we live here. Our kids go to school here. We pay taxes for our roads. We also have to have bigger picture thinking. Um, you know, I think it's a bit of a disservice when large oil and gas companies say things like by date X, we're going to be this mix of renewables. It's okay to have that mix of renewables and it's okay to plan for the future of a more renewable mix. 
But to discount hydrocarbons out that mix, I think is a disservice. It's because it's not going to happen. And we just need to do a better job um, as an industry and in making sure that we educate people on not only what we do for the, for the people in this industry, but the promise that we bring for the future. Um, so I went through this really quick. I'm actually running about uh, 19 minutes ahead of time, which would be a good time to ask some questions. Can we go to the next slide, though? So here's the thing. Anytime I, I, I speak to a group of people, I always try to leave something valuable. And so if you're watching this right now, grab your cell phone, take a quick picture of that so you can come back to it later. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me personally, one of the best ways is Twitter. Um, I respond much quicker. Another thing is when I first started my own business, which was 11 years ago, there was no single place in, in online that I could find all the oil and gas events and it aggravated me. So now I'll make my interns do it. So once a month, we send out this newsletter. It has all the oil and gas events that are going on, plus a lot of the insider only events. So the stuff that's not public or discount tickets or free tickets or whatever. So if you go to that URL, you can sign up for free. Once again, we don't spam you. It's a very useful tool if you're in the industry or if you're trying to learn about the industry. And then like was mentioned earlier, uh, we have, as of today, the top 11 oil and gas podcasts in the world. Uh, we'll have uh, two more added by the end of this month and about six more by the end of this year. And, and, the, and we're not stopping. Um, our podcast business is growing. Our live stream business is growing. Um, you know, so uh, if you want to check all that sort of stuff out, just go to OGGN.com. That's, that's the headquarters. That's OilandGasGlobalNetwork.com for, for our podcast, our live stream, and everything else we're doing. Um, Russ, we have some questions. I'm not used to the technology. Can you read them to me, or do you want me to open the chat window? Yeah, Mark, let me uh, go ahead and uh, read these off to you so we can uh... – have you expand on these? So, Oyango Snell, uh, speaking of skipping past building a robust, reliable infrastructure, California has followed the blueprint of emerging economies by pushing to eliminate internal combustion engine vehicles and promote electrification without a solid infrastructure. How do we talk facts about affordability, reliability, and equity with policymakers who live in a bubble? Oh, I tell you what, if you have the answer to that question, let me know, because I would love to know the answer to that, too. It is a really good point. And, and a lot of times there's effects that people don't think through. They don't think strategically. I'll give you a perfect example in the U.S. Eight years ago, companies started selling municipalities traffic cameras at intersections, right? And the way they sold is like, you don't need a police officer. You don't need to play payroll. We can give people tickets from the cameras and it'll keep your, your, your local municipality safer for less cost, which sounds great. You know what happened? It caused more T-bone uh, crashes. So drivers would see the camera. They hit their brakes for normally to try to go through light. And it caused more accidents. So they had the opposite effect of what they were trying to do. Um, the same thing is happening right now in California. And I love California. It's one of the most beautiful spots in the U.S., if not the world. Yeah. But some of the stuff they do just befuddles me. So if let's, let's think through this uh, getting rid of internal combustion engines and moving all electric vehicles. Number one, electric vehicles are for wealthy people. You can't produce electric, electrical vehicles today cheap enough for the common person or for the lower income person. So only the more affluent people can afford electric vehicles. Number two, do you know what's going to happen if you actually really pass that? You, now you're, complete, you're going to create a market for old internal combustion engines for people with lower income. Now, what kind of internal combustion engine do you think pollutes more? A new car or an old car? So California is well, basically shooting that in your uh, Mustang equation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so... And, and the other thing is we're still struggling. So we're in what I call phase one with, with renewables at scale. We've had renewables since the 60s. The oil and gas industry has been using solar forever in remote locations. But it's the first time we enter renewables at scale. And now all of a sudden you're having to deal with stuff like uh, changing out windmill blades, which, by the way, are made from hydrocarbons. You can't dispose of them. They can cut them up, and there's a few landfills that would take them, but they don't decompose. How do we deal with that? Um yeah. Same way with solar cells, same way with our current, you know, our most high tech battery right now is lithium. Do you know how destructive it is to the environment to mine for lithium? You know, and so we need to overcome that. And there's a bunch of smart people working on that. But back to the politics side, honestly, I throw my hands up. I, you know, um, I love my country. I did four years in Marine Corps. I'm very patriotic, but both sides don't get it. You got one side that hates us without knowing why they hate us. And you got another side that doesn't really know what we do. Really, I think in this country, we need a strong third party to come in that's, in, that's a moderate because I'm a moderate. Most of my friends are moderate, you know, um, 
to come in and try to uh, change everything. The problem is you can't have a third party come in unless they're big enough to actually disrupt something. And we've never had that happen. But yeah. the politics part of our industry drives me crazy. We need to disconnect politics with energy. Same way we did with the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve, whether you agree with them or not, are not collected politically. And that's why our, our currency is the strongest in the world. Every other current cur country measures their currency by ours because ours is so stable. We need to do the same thing with energy. We need to have a, a, an energy board in the federal government that's not connected to politics, that instead of having four-year terms, they sit for 10 years, so they bridge political cycles. And it needs to be engineers and businessmen who set the future for our country. So I, I wish I could fix the politics part. We can't. And so you see stupid stuff being done. Sorry. Well, and I think it goes back uh, to your point, cause and effect. You, you know, it's a reactionary public policy that they think they're doing something to uh, influence the next step. However, it may not always be thought through. And sometimes the effect of a, a decision isn't always what we anticipate, right? So so that's going to be a challenge we're going to have to live with, I think, ongoing for, for the future, Mark. Uh, not sure where Mark left off to. Um, uh, and also a question was, what is the future of hydrocar hydrogen fueled vehicles in fuel cells in fuel vehicles? And what would be the future if we land hydrogen fueled planes? Um, and hopefully Mark will be back on here and we'd be able to get him uh, in here. Uh, that's a great question, Raldo Alonso. And then also Michael Norris asked the question, why as an industry do I see us putting out more education information regarding energy choices? Many people think such as the Green New Deal are because that's what they hear. No one talks about the fish kills, poisonings, lithium and cobalt mining as an ex for example. So those are all great questions we want to be able to ans ask and answer during this, this live broadcast session. And we want to also extend the invitation for you to join us on SparkCon 2020 as we move forward through these other sessions. There's a lot of information that we're going to be talking about. There's a lot of things that we're going to have available to have you uh, utilize and collect and understand and maybe, you know, provide a, a workflow and a guideline for your future and your success. So I, I know that there's a many, there's a lot of topics we're going to be talking about. David Lewis this afternoon is going to be talking about the idea and the efforts as it relates to environmental concerns. So that ties in with that, that, uh, that message as well. So uh, thank you so much for that question, Michael. Um, did you hear the question, Mike, uh, Mark, or from Michael? No. Okay. Nope. And it was so funny. I was just thinking, no technical issues. And as soon as I thought that, boom. <laughs> do not, do not project anything challenging. So, uh, so which question did you last? Did you, did you last hear? Uh, just the one that I answered about the uh, politics. Okay. All right. So let's let's go into the other one. Uh, the next one, Geraldo Alonso said, asked, suggested we look, talk about is what is the future of hydrogen fueled vehicles, fuel cell vehicles, and what would be the future if we land hydrogen fueled planes? So awesome. I love hydrogen. It, it makes a lot of sense from a physics point of view. The, the cool thing is, guess what are the easiest ways to get hydrogen? You strip it out of natural gas. So once again, boom, hydrocarbons. Yeah. The problem is the infrastructure. And the problem is, what do you do with that hydrogen? So hydrogen, you actually can burn an, an internal combustion engine, and it's extremely clean. You also can use it in a fuel cell, which then takes electrical vehicles a different route. So instead of storing it in batteries, you store that energy as liquid hydrogen, feed it through a fuel cell. Both work really well. Um, the problem is infrastructure. So in this country and in Europe and in the rest of the world, we've done a really good job of building an infrastructure to move around explosive liquids, think of gasoline. So we can do the same thing with hydrogen. The problem is it, we have to hit a certain point where it makes economical sense. One yeah. of the ways you can move hydrogen is by mixing it with natural gas. So it kind of goes along free with the natural gas and you split it off, but it's only you only do four or 5% today. If you go to 10 or 12%, now you start affecting the, the um, 
physical properties of the pipeline. You can make the steel brittler. But if we, as as a originally as a country and maybe later as the world, if we fully embrace hydrogen technology and we build the infrastructure, I really think that's super promising for the future. Um, and, and it's great for the environment. The other way that you can make hydrogen is your electrolysized seawater. So remember I talked earlier about storage being an issue with the renewables and when everybody thinks storage, they think batteries. Well, you can also think physical storage. So in this case, if you have surplus solar, you can use it to electrolysize seawater, produce hydrogen and use that hydrogen in a hydrogen system. So there's a lot of promise there. There's some um, physical things we need to get around and then there's some cultural things we need to get around. Um, people right now don't think twice about filling a car with gasoline, right? It's explosive, but they don't think twice about it. And when you plug in an electric car, you're used to plugging in stuff. When you get a hydrogen car, the way you actually connect the hydrogen supply to the tank in the car is going to be different, and the risk will be different. And as a culture, as Americans and Europeans and later the rest of the world, do we want to make that change culturally? That's going to be the hard part, but it's a great fuel choice. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree. There's a lot of different, I mean, I've operated in propane vehicles, you know, and, and the process is different and it's not as convenient uh, than what we're used to. So change, when it takes place, it has to take place in a way that people accept and they're uh, they're looking forward to it rather than resistance to it. So one other question we wanted to have is, uh, uh why, as an industry, do I not see putting us? Uh, do I not see us putting out more educational information regarding energy choices? Many people think that, as such, the the Green New Deal are great because that's the way we're here. No one talks about the fish kills, poisonings, lithium and cobalt mining, for example. Like you mentioned, you know, lithium is is not necessarily the, <laughs> the easiest thing to to mine. So. Um, how do we how do we migrate towards uh, a better understanding and educational process in the industry? So as an industry, we tried very unsuccessfully to do big corporate marketing, huge dollar productions. Uh, you know, I spoke with API a couple of years ago. We did a Super Bowl ad, which I had a conniption fit about that. That doesn't work, and especially this new younger workforce that's coming in that has grown up with digital marketing the moment. The moment you do anything to try to market to them, they know it and they discount the whole thing. What works is ground root stuff. What works is what you've seen Anna Darko and uh, some of the other players done, done in Colorado where their employees who live in Colorado talk to their neighbors and show them, right? So not big corporate marketing, but people to people, uh, boots on the ground. The problem is you have to change people's opinion. If I had a time machine, I'd go back to the 60s and I'd talk to Exxon and Mobil, who were separate companies back then, and Chevron and Texaco, who were separate companies, and go, look, you have to be okay with your people talking to their neighbors about what they do. And if I could change that, because back then those companies were worried about proprietary information, and because most of their employees were engineers and project managers, they didn't want them to disclose proprietary information, so they made them all shut down. Even that culture still exists. It's it's hard to get somebody from Exxon and Chevron in a room together just to talk business, because the culture has been you don't talk about what you do. Um, if I could get those two changed in the very beginning of the, as those corporate cultures grew, and if I could go back to the guys that invented hydraulic fracking, who are geologists who don't understand people. And I go, look, don't call it hydraulic fracking, call it hummingbirds. If I could change those two things, we would not be in the point we are now. But the, the way to cor correct in the future is, is grassroots education. You know, my son goes to Fort Bend ISD. And when he was in eighth grade, their biology book talked about uh, peak oil. And I spent way too much money in about two years of time fighting that. And I won. So now you go back to that biology book and they've taken that part out. So I'm not expecting all of y'all to go fight your school districts over you know, peak oil um, supply in, in eighth grade biology books. But if you can just talk to your neighbor and go, no, 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 I get measured on my impact to the environment. Or no, 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 I volunteer went and planted trees. Or no, 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 we build schools in Africa because we're trying to help the population. If we can do more of that, we'll move the needle faster and faster. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent point. And, uh, you know, it's really important for us to understand that there are you know, when people take ownership of their their environment and their and their future, and they know what is happening, what what is actually happening, rather than what the the sound bites on the news are, then I think they can own, take ownership and and understand a little bit more about the industry. And I think that's that's where it can definitely improve uh, and, and groundswell opportunities. So uh, I just want to say uh, Nick Gimmel says, very good start to an awesome event, Russ and Mark. Uh, 
Uh, Aldo says, great beard, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dick. So, Gary Glenn says, have you seen energytalkingpoints.com? Do you think it's a good model for getting easy to digest information about the industry out there in a the broader public? I don't think I have. Is is that the group that's actually being pushed? It's one of the splinter groups of API because they have uh, several groups that are trying to engage with the public. The problem is it's still too much corporate marketing, in my opinion, but I haven't seen that one. Actually, um, I'll, I'll check it out after the show and get back to you. Yeah, that's that's a great question. I just want to bring it up to the to the to the audience here. Um, we talked about. Uh, fuels high mark big fan why are such virtual events so important now more than ever before because we can't get together in person <laughs> but it's actually more than that <laughs> so a lot of the stuff that's happening this year a lot of it's gonna stick a lot of it's for the better um yeah. you know our ability to get together virtually we finally have the the tool so think of uh in this case big marker but the other thing is we have inexpensive bandwidth, at least here in the US. A lot of the population have in, uh, access to big bandwidth pipes so we can actually do this. And what a great way to build a, a community, nurture a community, educate a community without having to get up, right? Without having to get up and get dressed, without having to go somewhere. Um, I still miss a lot of that in-person stuff, but I really think this could be a big part of the future. And I'm seeing things happen in our industry that in 2019, I would have told you you're crazy. I'll give you a perfect example. Every operating room, of every petrochemical plant refinery in the U.S. has spent a whole bunch of money making sure nobody could ever get into that remotely because it's scary, right? Some bioterrorist gets in to a refinery and starts moving valves and something blows up, people die, and you have this environmental catastrophe. And now in 2020, they've done the opposite. They had to flip it around so people can get remotely and do work. That's a great thing. Now you have less people in harm's way, and you can do the same work more efficiently. Um, it's the same way with the, the whole virtual world. So we started, we, we've always had live events around the podcast. And when this year happened, we had to stop our live events. We started doing live streaming. And now live streaming is part of our business model. It's part of our revenue model. How yeah. cool is it that you can make money live streaming and still educate people in a way that's fun, entertaining, and valuable? And so I think this is going to stick. It will evolve. There's some mistakes I've seen being made out there. I've seen several conferences try to replicate the conference in-person conference experience online. And that just doesn't work, right? It just, it doesn't work. But as we yeah. learn, as we get better and better you at know, this, I think you can see much more of this outside, outside of the boring zoom calls, right? Everybody's kind of sick of zoom calls, but this isn't a zoom call. This is us. This is many to many. So this is a panel, a bunch of experts come in to help share their knowledge and hopefully do it in an entertaining way. And I, I actually love this. And Mark, to your point, and I want to expand on this because you know, this whole conference, SparkCon 2020, is about knowledge transfer, knowledge management. And unless we continue to improve on the knowledge transfer and and just grabbing some of this information and really understanding what it means and what the impact is on this information, that's when we really start turning the corner on business and being able to be successful. And just like you talked about in Africa, you know, that new information is going to provide us with better understanding and solutions eventually. And we need to also use that knowledge and information and knowledge transfer to educate and uh, support the industry and the changes. And I just want to thank you, Mark, for being here, the first keynote speaker. Here. I know we're wrapping up today, and I just want to make sure that everybody understands that there's a lot of events taking place this afternoon. We're going to be talking about some of the environmental impacts and some of the safety concerns that you, your organization needs to understand and appreciate. And then we have uh, preparing for uh, tw 2022 and beyond important, important trends and their, their impacts, uh, compliance and knowledge management. We got uh, change in the digital adoption. We've got uh, uh, risk management. We got reducing risk and integrity of underground storage assets. Uh, there's a number of speakers improving construction and service agreements, improved ground investigation for pipeline and linear construction. These are all topics that we're talking about that are going to improve and enhance the industry and your knowledge and your guide to success. So join us at SparkCon 2020 and register and share this information out because I know it's important, it's valuable information. And you can find more about this at sparkcon.today. It's not .com, .today. 
So Mark, thank you so much for being here and look forward to future events just like this and sharing valuable information and knowledge with everyone in the industry. Yeah, this has been awesome. I had fun with the audience and with all of y'all as well. So looking forward to more. Thank you so much and really appreciate you. And everyone that showed up, we had a number of, uh, and thank you for the questions, the Q&A and everything that goes along with that. So until this afternoon, thank you so much. Look forward to the next, the next uh, session.